without waiting till we have everything? Okay. Let's go ahead and get started. Let's take a few moments. to worship. You can find a response of any alongside front cover of your bulletin. We're in Matthew 28, 1 through 6. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. Sing together when morning gilds the skies. When morning gilds the skies, my heart awakening cries. May Jesus Christ be praised. Unlike at work and prayer, to Jesus I prepare. May Jesus. of mankind in this your conquered mind may Jesus Christ be praised let all the earth around bring joy us with a sound may
tonight of being together as a family, as a church family, as we think and meditate on your scriptures, Lord. And as we do so, may Jesus Christ be praised. God, that is our heart. That is why we're here together tonight. We pray that the words of our mouth, the meditations of our heart, would be acceptable in your sight, our God and Redeemer. Please bless us, God. Uh, bless Pete as he brings your message. I think we should stay standing for this next one. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, he and forgive, he lived and died, to buy my prayer this evening is open our eyes Lord we want to see Jesus to reach out and touch you and say that we love Help us to listen. Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus. 
the reading of the word of God. <clears throat> Zechariah 3, 1 through 10. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel, clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing by. And the angel of the Lord solemnly assured Joshua, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my way and keep my charge, then you shall rule my house and have charge of my court, and I will give you the right of access among those who are standing here. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your friends who sit before you, for they are men who are assigned. Behold, I will bring my servants the branch, for behold on the stone that I have set before Joshua, on a single stone with seven eyes, I will engrave this inscription, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. In that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to come under his vine and under his fig tree. What a privilege to be with you this evening and to teach this extraordinary passage of scripture. As we turn to the Old Testament book of Zechariah, we need to remember where we are in redemptive history. Now, when you go to Bible college or seminary, they make you learn a lot of exact dates. So I'm not going to do that tonight. I'm going to, so experts, forgive me, okay? This is introductory, okay? We're going to round off the numbers in a big way, okay? They're not exact, but they'll give you a picture of where we are. So if you can imagine 2,000 years for Jesus. That's about the time of some man named Abraham who had Isaac and Jacob and his family. And then if you jump another 500 years about, you come to a period where some guy named Moses was on the scene. And then as you go another 500 years or so, you come to a great king by the name of David. And then if you jump another about 500 years, you come to the period where the Babylonian uh, captivity of the church occurs. Now, they're not exact, but it's interesting. They're roughly working this way in big 500-year lots. So what we are looking at tonight is a period about that 500 years before the coming of Jesus. It's about a 100-year period in which there is what Jeremiah calls a 70-year exile. And the people come back to the land. Under Nebuchadnezzar, Jerusalem is destroyed. After 70 years, there's a return back to the land. And in that period, after the exile, what would you call that period? The post-exilic period, right? It means after the exile. That's the time of the Old Testament we are in. We're in the period after the city of Jerusalem is destroyed. They've gone into Babylon. They're now back, and they are in the process of trying to start all over again. This is about a hundred year period and then we have what we call the 400 quiet years until Jesus comes. So that's kind of a, a bird's eye view on a very amateur level and I know my theological students say you got all the dates wrong. I said please forgive me. They're rough approximations. Okay, But that's where we are in history. Now as we think about that period then, the post-exilic prophets that are especially important for us are Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Can you say the names of the Old Testament books? Did you memorize those along the way? Okay, you know you come to the last three of the Old Testament. Haggai and Zechariah should be read together. They're two different prophets, 
but they're actually prophesying at exactly the same time. They're in the post-exilic period. Now, as we think about this period, we need to say, what's the issue? What are they concerned about? Well, could you imagine if the capital city of Washington, D.C. got totally decimated, but you had seen the Washington Monument in all of its glory. You had seen the White House and the Supreme Court building and the Jefferson and Lincoln monuments, and you saw the Capitol building with its dome. And then, as a young man, there's this terrible war. It's all leveled. And you finally get to come back as an old, worn-out person. And you see they finally start to rebuild it. Would you say, isn't it great? Or you say, man, the glory that we've lost. It's good we're starting again, but, you know, it's really not all that great. We've lost so much. Well, this is precisely where the returnees from the exile in Babylon were. Some had remembered the glory of the temple that Solomon had built, and now it's devastated. And they're trying to rebuild it. They're glad to be back, but the glory of the past is gone. And so it's interesting then when we look at this book written by a man, man named Zechariah, that we would remember some of the meanings of the Hebrew names that we're looking at. One of the problems that we have when we read the Bible is that we let the Hebrew names fly by and we don't stop to say, what do they mean? The names have meaning. And when you understand their meaning, they add a depth and a dimension of beauty. Zechariah means the I am that I am. <coughs> Yahweh, God, remembers. What a wonderful name, prophecy. I remember what was once here. I remember too. He was named with that name, meaning God remembers. This historical, historical context is a, a time when Zechariah is now trying to speak to the people in which there has been a tremendous loss, and they're beginning to rebuild in the post-exilic period. Let's look at Zechariah chapter 1 and verse 1 for a moment. It says, In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, son of Iddo. So there are all those names flying by. Let's just pause for a moment and say what their names are. Zechariah means the Lord remembers. The son of Berechiah means the Lord blesses. And the name Iddo means God continues. Their very names are saying God has not stopped his work with his people. God is going to bless, and he remembers his covenant. Those are all implicit in those names. And so as we look at this book, chapter 1, we find that Zechariah has an angel that is sent to him to give him visions. A prophet often has the ability to peer into the future, to see things that are not, and they're given by way of vision, divine disclosure, a special form of revelation. And so there's a vision of a horseman. This horseman says, the earth is at peace right now, but there's going to be war coming in the future, but my people are going to be spared. There's a vision of horns and craftsmen at the end of chapter 1. And this vision is the horns had to come against Israel, but now they're not going to come against Israel because there are craftsmen that are coming to turn those horns away because the Lord is coming to build. There's, in chapter 2, a vision of a man with a measuring line. He's going out and he's measuring the city, saying, guess what? Jerusalem is going to be remeasured, replumbed, rebuilt, and it's going to happen. And that then brings the context to our passage, chapter 3, a vision of Joshua the high priest. Now, you'll remember what was the most painful part of the loss of Jerusalem was the devastation of the worship of the temple. It was the identity of the people of Israel. Their covenant community was built upon this beautiful structure and the sacrifices and the worship and the praise. It was gone. And it was all led by a man called the high priest that had an unbroken succession that went all the way back to Moses and Aaron. Aaron was the first high priest. And now we have the vision of the high priest. And when we study the book of Ezra, 
there are people who come back from Babylon whose name are Zerubbabel and Joshua. You can read that in Ezra. They're part of the returnees coming back to the land. And Zerubbabel is the one who will be the royal governor, if you will. He's the political leader. And Joshua is a direct descendant of Aaron the high priest. And he's coming back, back to bring the religious leadership to the temple. And so we pause for a moment. Remember we said we need to remember the names? Well, Zerubbabel means someone who was born in Babylon. He's coming back. He's leaving Babylon to come to his city. But you should know the name of Joshua. I'm grateful for whoever titled my sermon tonight, the other Joshua. Whoever did that, good job. You know what the name of Joshua? Well, Joshua is the one who led the conquest of the land. But you know who the greater Joshua is? We sang about him tonight. It's Jesus. The name Jesus, Yeshua, Joshua, are one and the same name. They're not different names. They're spelled a little differently, but they're exactly the same. And what does Joshua or Yeshua mean? It means Yahweh or I am saves. Jesus' name means God saves us. He's called the Savior. That was the name that was given. This is, if you will, the Joshua between the greater Joshua. There's Joshua the conqueror, Joshua the high priest, and there's Joshua Jesus, who is both the conqueror and the high priest. He is the one who fulfills both of these names that come before. And so imagine where you're at now. The temple is utterly decimated. They're trying to start all over again. They haven't been able to have sacrifices in temple worship. They've been able to keep their lineage alive, and they're now back into the rubble of Jerusalem with a temple that's barely functioning with an altar they sort of put together. And they're trying to get the foundation done, and they run out of gas. You know, it's a lot of work to get all those stones. And for about 16 years, nothing happens except people looking at the foundation of the temple with an altar, but no temple built. And that's what Haggai and Zechariah are doing. They're saying, it's time to get the job done. The Lord is speaking. You're back. You started well, but then you stopped. In fact, if you read Haggai, it says, you build beautiful homes with wooden panels on it, but you haven't built anything for the Lord. Why aren't you finishing his house? That's the same message. And what Zechariah is giving is, look, the Lord is back with us. He is going to allow us to build this temple. The measuring liner is here. And guess what? He's going to reordain, if you will, the high priest. The Lord is going to put Jesus of the Old Testament back in place so he can do his job. That's where we begin at verse 1 of Zechariah 3. Then he, the angel, showed me, Zechariah, Joshua, the one whose name means the Lord saves. He's the high priest, descendant of Aaron, standing before the angel of the Lord. Now, we already have a problem. Who in the world is the angel of the Lord? Well, there's a lot of debate on this. Is he the spokesman that always shows up when God sees kind of like his uh, official spokesman between God and man? Is he actually a divine figure? Because he speaks for the Lord. Some have suggested this is a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. Now, you don't have to agree with that view. Not all do. But for tonight, let's just imagine that might be the right interpretation. It, maybe it's not. But let's just imagine it might be. That on this scene, as there is now Joshua the high priest being ordained back to office, the Lord God is there. An angel has brought Zechariah into this vision and the angel of the Lord, who is the ultimate Jesus, is watching. Now that makes this really a striking juxtaposition. The angel of the Lord looking at Joshua, the high priest. And they bear the same name, ultimately. And in this scene, we saw it find someone else standing there. It says, and Satan standing at the right hand to accuse him. Right next to Joshua the high priest, 
Satan himself. That one who caused the deception at the beginning, the fall of mankind, the one who prompted all of the suffering of Job. The word Satan means the accuser. The one who said, look, this man is a sinner. He's a scoundrel. And you notice he's standing on the right side of Joshua. That's the side of honor. Joshua, on his own, doesn't have the ability to deal with Satan. He has to say, man, Satan's pushing me around. He's in the place of honor in my life. And he's saying, this man's wicked. He can't be a high priest. Look at his failure. Look at his sin. See, in a moment, look at his filthy rags. He's supposed to be the high priest with beauty and glory. Look at the mess that he's in. And Satan is on his right hand to accuse him. We need to deal with Satan. He's accusing some of you tonight, saying you're really a wretch. What are you doing here tonight? You don't belong in God's people. How can you pretend to be a Christian knowing the mess you're those kind of accusations sound realistic. But Satan's work to accuse us, to show us our sin. And how wonderful as we come to the next verse, verse 2, and the Lord, the I am that I am, Yahweh, said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. Now notice, the Lord doesn't say, Joshua is sinless, leave him alone. The Lord simply says, as imperfect as this man is, I am defending him. I rebuke him. You shut up, Satan. You be silent. The Lord God of the universe is speaking. And the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Now, we need to stop here and put some theology to work. First of all, we do have an enemy of our souls. There's the world and the flesh, but there's the devil. And the devil is the great tempter and accuser of our souls. And we should not minimize the reality of that. One of the greatest tricks of Satan is to teach us to think that Satan is not real. He's already won the battle. If you believe your enemy doesn't exist, then your enemy can ruin your life and destroy you anytime he wills. Satan is real. And what is our answer? The Lord rebuke you, Satan. How does he do that? the gospel is. No one can bring a charge against God's elect. Who can accuse them if God justifies and God declares them righteous? And so God is the one who is rebuking Satan in his extraordinary grace. We see here the sovereign grace of God that makes salvation possible. A sinner that's accused by Satan is able to stand because God has spoken on his behalf declaring him to be one whom he has chosen. How about that? Divine election. God made a choice of Jerusalem and his people. He says, I have chosen this one. I have chosen Jerusalem. And therefore, I rebuke you. It's my choice as the sovereign God, Satan. You have no authority over him. And further, is not this a brand plucked from the fire? What is a brand here? Now, some of you are cowboys, like maybe Dr. Oliver, who thinks of a brand as a barbecue or something like that, right? It literally means a burning stick. You know what happens if you leave a burning stick in a fire? It gets burned, consumed. You pull it out, you spare it. It's ready to be consumed and destroyed, but it's snatched from the fire, and it is not burned. Joshua is one who's lost, but by God's choice, by God's rebuke of Satan, he is snatched from the fire and he will be spared. He will be saved from destruction. To be saved means to be spared from destruction. This is a brand that's plucked from the fire. This is, if you will, one who's been redeemed by sovereign grace, chosen and rescued or saved. Do you know these terms from Christian theology? Yes, I do. This is the scripture. It keeps going. Now Joshua, now the one whose name means salvation, who has just been saved. Now the one whom the Lord saves, that's his name, was standing before the angel. And he was clothed with filthy rags, filthy garments. 
We remember how Isaiah says, all our righteousness are as filthy rags. Here was this high priest. And if you remember the story of Exodus chapter 28, go back and read it again, it describes what the high priest was supposed to look like. He was to have garments that were unparalleled in their beauty, filled with color and the highest quality of material, so that he could stand uniquely in the presence of God. The one thing you would not describe the high priest about when he was in his regalia was filthy garments. This is one who has lost everything of his beauty. His garments are tattered and they're filthy. The high priest has been in exile. He's been on a long journey. He's probably been out trying to rebuild the temple. And they're poor and broken and they're trying to rebuild it. He's filthy. What happens with this one who is standing with all his filthy garments? And the angel said to those who are standing before him, verse follows by saying, remove the filthy garments from him. And he said to him, behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you and I will clothe you with pure vestments. Now, just stop for a minute. What does that mean? It means that something has to be put off something else to put on. That's the language that we'll read all the way through the New Testament when Paul writes. In fact, we might think about it this way. You need to have your sin removed from you, and you need to be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Here we have the doctrine of salvation. When we are forgiven, two wonderful things happen in our justification. The first thing that happens is our sin is removed from us. Now, this passage doesn't explain exactly how it happens, but the theological words we use that are expiation, meaning that the sin is now totally canceled, or propitiation, the sin is totally satisfied before God's holy wrath. But the point is that the sin is removed. He is forgiven. And now there is a righteousness that is credited to his account, that is imputed to him. This is being clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Theologians describe that as both the active and passive righteousness of Christ. What does that mean when we're clothed in the righteousness of Christ? It means that his suffering on the cross, that righteous suffering, becomes, if you will, the payment for our sin. We are right because he paid the price. But his passive obedience on the cross, his bearing our guilt, is joined with his active obedience. All of the demand of the law, everything that God's law says we must do, Jesus did without sin. And when we trust in Christ, all of his perfect righteousness, obeying all the law of God without sin, becomes ours. We heard the verse earlier that Augustine opened up and read, Make no provision for the lust of the flesh, but put on the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what is happening. Joshua needed to be clothed in the righteousness of the greater Joshua. This is justification by faith. Now, what is uh, very interesting is that the name that we're looking at in Hebrew I wrote down all the Hebrew names, and I want to make sure I don't miss one of them right here. Joshua, his last name is not, or the son of, which would be the last name, is not given here. Joshua means Yahweh saves. You know what his father's name was? Jehozadak. You know what that means? God justifies. Joshua had a father whose name God can justify. His name was God can save us. And the picture is, that's exactly what God is doing for Joshua. Joshua is being saved by God because God has declared him to be righteous with the garments of righteousness placed upon him. And you notice, he doesn't put them on himself. This is an act of grace. He is receiving what God has done. And so as we look at our verses so far, what we are seeing is the New Testament 
doctrine of justification by God's grace. Here it is, beautifully written. The angel of the Lord, if he's Jesus, Joshua, was looking at Joshua, the high priest, he could not live up to, who also needed to have a righteousness given to him and received by faith. So he stopped. Is that yours? Have you by faith come with beggar's hands to a sovereign God and said, Lord, I have nothing in my hands I bring. Only to your cross I cling. I receive what you have done. Jesus, what you accomplished on the cross. By faith I claim it. By your mercy I hear the call of the gospel. And I would ask that it might be said of me, remove the filthy garments from my life. And behold, take away my iniquity and clothe me with the pure vestments of the righteousness of Christ. Isn't that wonderful? Now it doesn't stop there. This New Testament doctrine of justification that's woven into this context continues. And I said, okay, Zachariah says, well, you've got, if he's the high priest, you've got to put a turban on his head. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing by. Now that clean turban, if you, of course, was the beginning of what we might call glorification. The beginning of the, if you will, the royal appearance that he's now a special person. But it's not quite complete. In fact, Zechariah will address this if you turn over to chapter 6 for just a moment and read along at verse 9 in Zechariah chapter 6. It says, And the word of the Lord came to me Take from the exiles Heldai, Tobjiah, and Jedediah, who have arrived from Babylon, and go the same day to the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. Take from them silver and gold and make a crown and set it on the head of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak. Okay, there's the name. Joshua, God saves. The son of Jehozadak, God justifies. The high priest, that's who he is. And say to him, thus says the Lord of hosts, behold the man whose name is the branch, for he shall branch out from his place and he shall build the temple of the Lord. It is he who shall build the temple of the Lord and shall bear royal honor and shall sit and rule on his throne. And there shall be a priest on his throne and the council of peace shall be between them both. And the crown shall be in the temple of the Lord as a reminder to Helam, Tobijah, Jedediah, and the hen and the son of Zephaniah. And those who are far off shall come and help to build the temple of the Lord. And you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And this shall come to pass if you'll diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. Now, we need to stop for a moment and say there's a special provision as this turban is being put on his head. It's not complete. It's beginning to, it's this honor. He's wearing the high priest's turban. But there needs to be a crown placed upon him. Isn't it interesting that the crown is not made for Zerubbabel? Zerubbabel was the political figure. He's the one that should wear the crown. But who has the crown placed upon his head? The high priest. The priest bears the office of a king, even as he's a priest. Now, if you know your Old Testament history, the priest and the king come from two different tribes. How is it possible they can come together? because this is one who's greater than any Old Testament high priest. This is the King of kings and Lord of lords, who's not only the royal king, but our high priest, who can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. This is the greater Joshua who is king, and he is also priest. And as we come back to our passage, Joshua now is showing that he is entering into, if you will, glorification. Now, wait, this is a sinner. How does a sinner get glorified? That's because of what the greater Joshua does. Do you remember that ordo salutis that you've heard talked about in Sunday school? Those whom he foreknew, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. By union with Christ, that crown be placed upon your head too. 
What does Peter call the church? We are a royal priesthood. We are united to Christ. And what is true of this Joshua is true of us. When's the last time you looked at the mirror and said, man, you, you know you're a princess in the kingdom of God? When's the last time you looked in the mirror and said, no, you are a king. I was a priest called to serve God. This was done for a wicked sinner. And by union with the greater Joshua, this is what is done for us. The order of salvation. Do you notice the pieces? Sovereign election. God who speaks a word to resist the condemnation, who provides a righteousness that clothes him, who takes away the guilt of the sin, who gives him a glorification that includes even the crown of rule. How is that possible? That's the grace that we have in Jesus Christ, beautifully played out before us. And the angel of the Lord was standing by, that's Jesus, don't you think Jesus would do that? That's what I'm going to do for every other fallen, broken person who belongs to my family. That's why I'm going to be incarnate. We come to verse 6. And the angel of the Lord solemnly assured Joshua. Isn't that wonderful? All of these things are happening, but Joshua, like us, is saying, My conscience is filled with my guilt and my shame, my failure and my sin. And the Lord assures him. One of the great fruits of justification by faith alone is assurance. The ability to know, I know I really am the Lord's. Not because of how good I am, but because of how complete the finished work of Christ is on my behalf. I am clothed righteousness of Christ by faith. He's assured. But notice this assurance. It's not some easy believism. He says, well, now don't worry about it. Just go out and get your garments dirty again, and you're fine. Notice what he says next. Verse 7. Thus says the Lord of hosts, if you will walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you shall rule my house and have charge of my courts and I'll give you the right of access among those who are standing here. He says, look, this grace is absolutely free. It's absolutely sure. You can be confident, and it requires you to live in a humble faith that obeys the Lord who's given you all of this relief. Our free, sovereign grace of justification and assurance calls us to what we call sanctification. We now need to become who we are. As we, if you heard the, the discussion with Dr. Oliphant on Saturday morning, he made the comment about how the indicative must in, precede the imperative. All of the gospel work is done first. That's the fact. And then comes the duty. Our duty does not bring us to the reality we long for. The duty flows out of the grace that we have received. And it's that grace that enables us to keep the covenant responsibility of walking in my ways and keeping my charge. So that means that sanctification is by grace just as much as justification is. It all flows from God's sovereign gift of grace to us. But it is a real duty. We are now to live out. We are to work out what God works in us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And as a result of that, we are given the privilege to rule my house and have charge of my courts, and I'll give you the right of access among those who are standing here. We could read that as an ecclesiology passage. It means if you live this way, you're going to become a leader in my church. This is what we would expect of elders and deacons and Sunday school teachers and missionaries and evangelists. This is what we would expect. But you know what? It might have even bigger implications. You are going to have the privilege in all of God's courts. God's temple is as big as the universe. 
I'm giving you back the blessing of paradise. The creation mandate is being restored. You are going to have the privilege of dominion wherever you go because you are going to be under my grace. And if you go into business, you're under my grace. If you go into scholarship, you're under my grace. If you go into sports, you're under my grace. You're going to be leading and ruling for me wherever you go, wherever my court of rule is, because you're a royal priest. How about that? Do you realize that whatever you do, you step out not only as the royal priest on behalf of God, but you are his vice regent in this world? You are advancing Christ's kingdom wherever you go, whatever you touch, whatever discipline you have, whatever area. As we walk with the Lord, he opens up doors for us to do things that honor his kingdom. My goodness, what we're doing here is we're seeing the creation mandate of Genesis 1 being connected with the great commission of Matthew 28. And it's right here in Zechariah 3. As we walk with the Lord, we are called to become leaders in all of God's house in all of his courts, and I'll give you the right of access. Isn't that wonderful? When you fail and when you struggle, guess what? You have a high priest who can be felt with the feelings of your infirmity. You can rush to the Lord God's holy uh, throne at a moment's need and say, Lord, I've sinned. Will you bless and forgive me? He will. Because you are his child. A right of access that flows out of the sanctification and assurance of having been justified by faith because of God's sovereign election. I'm preaching the New Testament out of Zechariah 3. Are you catching that? This is Jesus' ministry all the way back here in this post-exilic period. And it keeps going. He says, Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, you and your friends who sit before you, for they are men who are a sign. He said, okay, <clears throat> what happened in this vision? Satan has been defeated. Sin has been removed. Righteousness has been imputed. Assurance has been granted. The ability to begin to live in a holy life is assured. And now the rule of the kingdom of this one, this Joshua, is now sure. Now I want you to hear that this is a sign. What is done here, you need to look at it and see that it's a metaphor for something that's far greater to come. This is not just a vision for this moment in time. It's not just for Joshua the high priest as this time of trying to rebuild the temple is taking place. It's a sign pointing to something far greater. And of course, this is what Jesus wanted us to think about in Luke 24. That you know the law, the prophets, and the Psalms, they all speak about me. This is what the Lord is saying. This is a sign pointing to the greater Joshua. Hear now, O oh Joshua, the high priest, you and your friends. Isn't it wonderful? This isn't just for you, Joshua. These are for those who are now part of your family of faith. This is true for others to see. The you are men are assigned. Behold, I will bring my servant the branch. Okay, one who's a servant. Now, when we read the passage of Zechariah 6, it mentioned the branch again. There's a little bit of a sense in which Zechariah is the branch at this moment in time. But now it's saying you are just a sign of the great branch. Why the word branch? Well, I, I kind of, when I read this, I'm reminded of a giant tree that was in the back of my grandchildren's house in Long Beach, New York. Remember Hurricane Sandy? That made a lot of news all over the world. That's where they were, Hurricane Sandy totally flooded this place, and this big ancient tree lost all its leaves and died. And then a couple years later, came a little branch. And now that branch is as big as the old tree once was. It's just taken over the whole backyard. That's the image. This is from the stump of Jesse will come forth another root, another tree, another branch. The tree of life is going to be born again. Remember the tree? This is now the branch in the tree of life. It's beginning to take life and shape again. 
It's beginning to take place. And this branch with a capital B is my servant, the one who has come not to do his will, but to do the will of his father. He said, that's how you know I really am God, because I do what my father has called me. This is Jesus talking here. And what did Jesus say? Uh, That I am the branch. You are branches in the branch, the vine. This is language of union, intimacy. For behold, there's not just a branch, but on the stone that I've set before Joshua, on a single stone with seven eyes, I will engrave its inscription, declares the Lord of hosts. Now, this language would bring us into the book of Revelation. We read about this precious stones of heaven. But the seven eyes, we wonder, what in the world are they? We might think of in lapidarian terms as facets of a diamond. But what he's suggesting here is the book of Revelation will say, this is the image of the Holy Spirit. The seven eyes means the all-seeing perfection of the light of God that comes from the Holy Spirit. He interprets scripture with scripture. The seven eyes are the spirit of God. And the picture here is I have a servant who is the branch and he is one who is going to bring a precious stone like the high priest who had a stone on his garments and this will be filled with with the perfection of the Holy Spirit. And what we have here then is the image of Christ and this church being born upon his breast with the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's not just the Spirit, but notice it's coupled with the word. I will engrave its inscription. This stone that has the beauty of reflection of light like a diamond that glimmers in the sun, also has words. It's word and spirit joined together. One of the beautiful studies you might do of scripture is how word and spirit are always integrated. And here it is in this image of this restored Joshua, looking to the greater Joshua to come. He will be one that has the light of God in all of its transcendent glory, and it'll be joined with the very word of God written upon it. Notice, declares the Lord of hosts. He said, this is going to happen. And this sign, this one who's coming, who's the branch, who's the servant, who has the Holy Spirit's beautiful reflection coupled with the word, when he comes, it's going to be a work of him when he, will, through God, I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. There's going to come a day when human sin of God's people is utterly removed in a single day. You know what we call that? We call that Good Friday. And how was sin removed? What was this word? Finished. The price is paid in full. Good Friday. The cross. What God was doing in the vision for Joshua is pointing to a sign of the greater Joshua. And here he is with the finished work of Christ on the cross. For behold, on the stone that I've set before Joshua, on a single stone with seven eyes, I will engrave its inscription, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. In that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you. Let us notice that there is absolutely a definite, accomplished, Everyone for whom this price is paid will, in fact, come. If you want to use tulip language, this is the L of a tulip in the Old Testament. Every one of you who is in part of this are going to come and be cleansed and forgiven by God's sovereign grace through this atoning sacrifice on this day. Every one of you. And you will invite your neighbor to come under his vine, and under his fig tree. Now that language at the end is the picture of the heavenly kingdom at rest. You find it multiple times throughout the scriptures that every man will sit under his vine and fig tree and there will be none to make them afraid. In other words, Satan is not only bound, he's off the scene. 
He's not there standing to accuse you anymore. You sin with all of the things that causes you to doubt. The struggles that you have to go through to try to serve the Lord, you can relax. Sit under your vine and fig tree. The vine and fig tree were the symbol of a beautiful farm that had matured to the point that you could live comfortably by what it produced. That's the image of the eternal kingdom of God. We could say every man sits under the tree of life. The branch will bring us to the tree of life, and we have everything we ever have to have. I think that's a pretty extraordinary vision for a ragtag group of people in the middle of a time when everything is lost trying to start again. But it's in your Bible. And it is only another example of how the Lord wants us to learn to read the scriptures. And as Spurgeon said, whenever I read the Bible, I head straight cross country for Jesus. He's everywhere. And here he is in the most remarkable way. So let's finish up by just rehearsing what we said. There is a Joshua named the high priest who was not able to do his job because he was such a sinner. And standing next to him was the ultimate Joshua, the ultimate Jesus, whose work proleptically reached back to cleanse him is a sign of what's for every one of us in life. Have you put your trust in Christ? Do you know for sure that you've been clothed with the righteousness of Jesus so you know that your sin is forgiven and that you're right? And there's no one who can make you free. Not even Satan himself. And when you realize you've blown it, and you will, and you have, you have access and assurance to say, Lord, I want to live your way. I come back to you. That's the wonderful gift this passage brings you. It's the good news of Jesus written for 150 years at least before he ever came. It may be yours tonight. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to open up a prophetic text. We pray that the sign that was given to Joshua, the high priest, would be one that would let us see what we need and what we can have. Because you have come, Lord Jesus. You are the one that means that Yahweh saves. Lord, save us. And may we be clothed in this righteousness that we've read of tonight. Pray it in Christ's name. Exalted, O oh God.
will. Please receive this blessing of God's word. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now and forever. Amen. Okay, we're going to gather together for some fun in the back, so head right over that way. Okay. Thank you.